opening prayer by Nadir Ahmed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That is peace be unto you and the mercy of Allah and his blessing. I'd like to open with the Al-Fatiha. First I will recite in Arabic, then the English translation. And this is the opening chapter of the holy book of the Muslims, the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman rahim Malik yawm al-deen. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعينت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Say I seek refuge with Allah against shaitan the rejected with the name Allah most gracious most compassionate praise be to Allah the Lord of all the worlds, most gracious, most compassionate, master of the day of judgment. Thee alone do we worship and thine aid we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy grace, not those upon whom wrath is brought down, nor those who go astray. Amin. Assalamu alaikum. Next, brothers and sisters, we shall have Quranic recitation being recited by Brother Hanif Abdul Rahman. Thank 
of the pen, taught man that which he knew not. Nay, but man doth transgress all bounds, in that he looketh upon himself as self-sufficient. Verily, to thy Lord is the return of all. Seest thou one who forbids a votary when he turns to pray? Seest thou if he is on the road of guidance or enjoins righteousness? Seest thou if he denies truth and turns away? Knoweth he not that Allah doth see? Let him beware. If he desist not, we will drag him by the forelock, a lying, sinful forelock. Then, let him call for help to his council of comrades. We will call on the angels of punishment to deal with him. Nay, heed him not, but bow down in adoration and bring thyself the closer to Allah. Sadaqallah al azim surely Allah speaks the truth. We thank these brothers very much. It's always uh, it's customary and it's always a pleasure to start off any meeting that we have, any gathering, with the words of God. Next, we will have welcoming remarks from the Imam Masjid Wali Muhammad on Elijah Muhammad Boulevard, formerly Linwood, in Detroit, Michigan. Imam Dawood Ahmed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Ashadu an la ilaha illallah Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abdul rasul With the name Allah the most gracious, the most compassionate Praise be to Allah, the Lord of all the world I bear witness that nothing is worthy of worship except Allah alone and I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is his slave servant and messenger. We thank Allah, highly praised is he, for his favors and blessings in allowing us to welcome Imam Wasdeen Muhammad and his family here at Detroit, in Kobo Arena. Allahu Akbar. We'd like to welcome our 
distinguished guests, uh, dignitaries, uh, our guests running for office, political office, our governor-elect, our county commissioners, and so forth. Our imams would like to welcome our imams from across the country. We'd like to thank them for their support in bringing this affair into sight. Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, has said that those who believe in Allah in the last day should be kind and generous to their guests. We like everyone to feel relaxed, feel welcome in hearing our Imam, the man that we love, the leader for the Muslims across America and throughout the world. And we have an Imam from our masjid here in Detroit, Masjid Wali Muhammad, Imam Dawood Abdul Alim, who's worked hard in this affair, bringing it about. He will be introducing our Imam, Imam Wasi Muhammad. And we'd like to thank everyone. We'd like you to relax, open up your mind, Get your ears ready for the clear voice, for Allah is truly blessing us to have in our midst someone who's able to put up with the confused state that we find ourselves in today. We should thank Allah often. We can't thank Him enough. We should thank Him. We should praise Him only and allow ourselves to be receptive of this great miracle that we found in 1986 and all this confusion that we find today. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. And now, to introduce Imam Muhammad, Imam Daoud Alim. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وقده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله We seek refuge with Allah against shaitan the accursed and rejected enemy I openly give testimony that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, the one and only, and that Muhammad is his messenger. Dear beloved people, peace be unto all of you, and may Allah's peace and blessings be upon all the righteous people before us, and all the righteous servants before us. I mean. To Allah is the praise, to Him is the kingdom, and to Allah is the rule. Any individual with any kind of common sense would take on the responsibility of trying to bring whatever metropolitan, urban, or rural area that they live in, try to bring them to a practical way of living that the Holy Qur'an has given the Muslims. God Most High in the Qur'an does not say this is a book for Muslims. God Most High in the Qur'an says this is a book for the regardful. The first regard that one must have is the regard that there is a creator. Then after they decide that there is a creator, Accept the fact that he is the ruling source, the mok. He is the rule. And that to him is the praise. Then people can go into the regard of the other things in life. Family life means nothing if Allah is not first accepted in that family life. 
ethnicity, having the cultural understanding, the historical background and the pride as a people means nothing if Allah or God or whomever, whatever you call him is not there first. Having regards for money, the economic growth, the economic development, the stability to be able to buy things and do things for your people, it means nothing if God is not there first. Being a race of people, recognizing what it's like to be put together under what you would call a banner of misinterpretation or misunderstanding, to be able to overcome that type of shackle is nothing if Allah is not there first. Dear beloved people, we have in a leader the character of one that is unique, something that's different that most people don't have. We as a people, we have to be able to understand and be able to see past ourselves. We have to be able to realize that common sense is what's going to bring about our salvation. The Muslims have a leader, but not only do the Muslims have a leader, mankind has a leader. Imam Waqidin Muhammad is respected wherever he goes throughout the world. The world knows what he represents and the world has accepted that. But the people who don't accept it are usually the ones closest to Imam Waqidin Muhammad. I'm talking about the Islamic community. We have to realize that our salvation has come. We have to realize that our salvation will be tomorrow. We have to realize that our salvation will never stop as long as we believe in Prophet Muhammad as being the Prophet, Allah being the one God, and we have a teacher in Imam Wajideen Muhammad. Some of you may say, but well, what happens after Imam Wajideen Muhammad? Well, this is the introduction to you. Imam Muhammad is a man that is bringing the word of Allah through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. He is the best example. There's none like him anywhere on the earth in regard to example. This is the reason why I take that challenge to say this. In the days of the late Honorable Elijah Muhammad, may Allah's peace be upon him, forgive him his sins and grant him paradise. Imam Muhammad came into a situation where men and women, the primary concern was money. There was no moral structure as to how that money came about. Many men and women have lost their life and sacrificed themselves to follow that scheme. We have a leader, dear beloved people, that we want the world to know that came into a situation and pushed the money away. He did not push the money away because the money was not needed. Imam Muhammad pushed the money away because the money wasn't coming the right way. <laughs> Muslims don't clap. Let's internalize what we're saying because if we leave here today, we have to go back to our prospective cities and we shouldn't go with our minds focused on the fact that we were in Detroit, Michigan on July 20th. We should be able to go back with the fact that we received a message from someone today and we can take that message back. If not, the trip was in vain. Our leader, many people know him as being a Mahdi. No one wants to accept that. So they accept the fact that he is the Mu'alam. A woman told me to make sure I explain those terms. Well, the Ma'alam is the teacher. This is the one that gives the information and puts it out into the atmosphere and trusts Allah that someone will receive it. I strongly believe that the leaders for the Muslim community today are not only the men and women on this stage, but many of you out there who have not been given a chance in your life. 
All you have to do is accept that right there, put your faith in Allah, and can continue to persevere and follow Imam Muhammad. And as I close this down, I'm going to tell you who the Mahdi is. In physics, they say for every action, there's a reaction that brings about a change. If you can agree that Imam Muhammad is the, is the, is the Mu'alim, that is the teacher, the one who gives the information and brings it about, but it's not the information that the average teacher gives you. I believe in Washington, D.C., Imam Muhammad called the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, the greatest teacher. I asked him, Brother Imam, what did you mean by that? He said, well, Prophet Muhammad is the only man that got divine revelation. So that's what made him the greatest teacher. So today, we have the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad through the Quran and the life of the Prophet Muhammad, and we have that best example. So when a teacher comes out and teaches you that you have a responsibility for yourself, you have a responsibility for your family, you have a responsibility for your ethnicity, you have a responsibility of understanding what racism can be, positive or negative. When you take one like that and follow him over the years and you study what he has said and the people begin to respond, I feel you are a great audience. The reason I feel that is because Allah has allowed you to be here. I don't see any residue in the audience. And if there is some, surely Allah knows. But this audience is true, it's sincere, and we commend you for coming today. Let's not let that good, honest coming be a failure by leaving and not sharing the word of Imam Muhammad. Now, as I introduce our leader here, the Mahdi, and I say it that way because the Mahdi is the one that guides. After a man has taught you, he cannot continue to come behind and keep teaching you. He has to sit back like the Khalifa and see how now you've accepted what he has said. And when you've accepted what Imam Muhammad has said through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, we will see America begin to recognize that there's one Muslim and none other. You will begin to see the kind of exposure we got today with governors, judges, future governors, future doctors and lawyers coming up here and being in the company of the righteous. These are the last people that usually come around. But today we offer a challenge to all of you. Those that have children, your children are going to take the seat of the men like Mr. Lucas. Your children are going to take the seat that I represent. Your children are going to take the seat that Imam Muhammad represents. But the only way you're going to do it, you're going to have to accept the Mahdi and follow the guidance of our leader, Imam Wajid D. Muhammad, as I bring him to you. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all of us, the Mu'alim, the Mahdi, Imam Wajid D. Muhammad. Takbir! 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 Assalamu alaikum. Let us peace be unto you. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah that is God, Lord of all the world. We seek Him for assistance. We turn to Him asking His forgiveness and His mercy on us. And we praise him and pray the choicest blessings upon his servant, the universal messenger Prophet Muhammad, to whom the Quran was revealed. Peace and the blessings be on him and on his descendants and the companions of the Prophet. All and upon us be peace. I thank Allah for this day for giving us an opportunity to meet here in Detroit, Michigan at this facility, Kobo Hall. I thank Allah for the efforts of Imam Dawood Alim and for the efforts 
of the resident imam here and also <clears throat> for the efforts of those who backed and supported them in direct cooperation with them or otherwise. We are to be, to be congratulated those who have come here from distances far. I met a very good brother and Muslim law, have law, who has long standing as Muslim among us, Brother Shams Dean, businessman from Atlanta, Georgia. I met the assistant, assistant uh, to Imam Maladine of Houston, and who's also a chaplain in the prison system out there in Texas. I met him here. I've seen <clears throat> Muslims from the far west, from the south, and we all are to be congratulated. Those who came from nearby places, Chicago, that is not far from here, and even from the state of Michigan itself, and even from Detroit itself, those who walked 10 blocks to come here, they are to be congratulated. Because it is clear to everybody that we don't have any quick worldly excitement to offer you. We are not inviting you here to get rich in the ways of the world. We are not inviting you here to have fun in the ways of the world. This is not the usual kind of gathering and the agenda what we will be talking about today is not the kind of concern or topic that the masses of people come to hear or rally around. So you are to be congratulated. It must be understood that people still believe in an authority and a power above them. That people still believe in Allah. It must be understood that people still seek to know better what Allah wants for them. There are people still interested in religion. There are people still willing to pay money, to travel far, to separate from their attachments, to gather under the voice of call to faith. Many times I've been met upon coming to a city by the press and the question most often asked, what brings you here, Imam Muhammad? If I was a great singer, a great dancer, a great actor, no one would ask me what brings me here.
At this point, I want to read a few words from our holy book. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Ra. كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, Alif Lam Ra, This is a book sent down to you, O Muhammad, that you may bring mankind out of the dark into the light with the permission of their Lord to the path of the one who's mighty and dear and worthy of all praise. Allah, that is. For him is whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. I also would like to bring to you the words of our prophet, peace and the blessings be on him, who said, advising or answering a question for one who was seeking to be advised or to be informed by Muhammad the prophet as to what the prophet could give him that no one else could give him. And the prophet in his reply to him said, Qul amantu billahi thumma staqim. Say, I have faith in Allah and thereafter be upright. that Muslims be not victims of lies, it is necessary for us to meet in great numbers from many places where we reside in America to hear, if not me, Someone who is sincere and strong enough to tell the truth. To tell the truth about our religion. We have many claiming to be leaders in this religion, but we have very few with the carers to tell the truth about this religion. Too many in the leadership that presents itself as Muslim leadership are really imposters 
working for enemies of this religion. If we who sincerely believe in the Quran, our holy book, which is a universal book, it's not the book just for us in America, it's the book for all of us throughout the world. It didn't come by our doings here in America. It was a thousand years old when we were brought to America. This book that I'm talking about. If the sincere and the strong among the Muslims will not assert themselves to represent this religion as it should be represented, then we have nothing. We have nothing. It is enough to justify our time and money and effort that we've made to be here today. If we are Muslim, it is enough that we clear the air as to what is truly Muslim and what is not. If we accomplish no more than that, then it justifies the time and the money and the efforts we've made or spent. We must understand that we are a minority religious group in America and a very small minority group in America. We must understand that we belong to a religion that had enemies from the very first day of its pronouncement on this earth. Our prophet, peace and blessing be on him, was a native son of Mecca on the peninsula now called Saudi Arabia and was a, also a son of the most respected tribe of the Arabs, the tribe called Quraysh. But that did not prevent him from having enemies when he began to preach what Allah had revealed to him as a last message for all the world. He very soon found strong, very vowed, avowed enemy. among his own relatives. Two of his worst enemies were his uncle, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal. The people he found himself among known him to be honest and honorable. They called him the trustworthy one. That was the name that the people gave him. El Amin they called him, El Amin, the trustworthy one. However, the same people that had called him the trustworthy one and who had really come to him as though he was the bank for their country and deposit with him their valuables so they could 
take a trip safely and return knowing their valuables would be there when they got back. That same man that they so regarded, so highly regarded, became the greatest trouble for them because they were not willing to say, Amantu Billahi Tumastapim. They were not willing to say, I have believed in God and I chose, chose to be upright. If I have a problem with people today, it is because I follow in the tradition of that great man, Muhammad, the universal prophet. And there will be people today who won't like me because I say, believe first in God and thereafter be upright. But that doesn't bother me. Doesn't bother me at all. In fact, it makes me happy to know that God has blessed me to be a trouble in the midst of disbelievers. It is a blessing to be a trouble in the midst of disbelievers. They should be troubled. And I wish I was better in my life and conduct so I could trouble them more. We have to be aware that we are a small minority in America. The majority of the people belong to some other religion. And that the same foes, the same enemies of Islam, the same enemies of the Prophet, are here on earth today and are as determined today as they were then to deny this religion a life and a presence on this earth. And we have to be then as committed to this mission as strong in our position, as willing to sacrifice our time, our money, and even our life if we must, for this religion, if we are truly Muslim. I think Allah that the situation is not as difficult for us today as it was for our prophet and his companion. We live in a time and, in a, and, and among a people who claim to be civilized, claim to be democratic, they claim to be liberal, they claim to accept even our religion as a legitimate religion that should not be persecuted but should be welcomed in the land, uh, homeland of man. A religion that President Madison and other presidents of the United States have given words of recognition for. Our religion, our Islam. A religion that the late, not the late, but the president, once president, recent president, very recent president, Jimmy Carter publicly paid tribute to our religion, Al-Islam. But you must understand that even though this country is committed to respect the great established religion, the situation for us as religious people, as Muslims, is no different than the situation for the American Indian or for many other minorities in this country who have their rights protected in law but their rights taken away from them by the ungodly not only in the public but in government quarters. They are working hard to deny this religion life, pleasant presence, and a future on this earth.
If I had a wife, that men were jealous of, or jealous of me because of her, a wife that other men wanted, it would make me appreciate her even more as long as she wasn't being affected. secretly to discredit and I knew myself that she was a fine wife, a good wife, a treasure to be valued. It would make me all the much more committed to that wife. It would make me stronger in my love for her and stronger in my determination to stick by her. I think I have such a wife in Shirley. <laughs> religious community life is of that value to us and that there are devilish people working quietly and secretly all the time to hurt the Muslim community to discredit the Muslim community weaken your admiration for the Muslim community to make you fear to put your faith in the future of the Muslim community oh they are working so hard they are working hard day and night our crowd would be much smaller here today if they weren't here. You're here, but they're also here. They have to be here. Because they always want to be the closest ones, closest to what's going on, so they can be in the best position to hurt what we are all about. But thank Allah again, I say, that there are times in the situation is not as bad for us as it was for our prophet feasting the blessing be on him and his companions. May God be pleased with them. We are in a situation now in America where it is against the law to do the things that those heathens did against Muhammad. It is against the law. They cannot openly come out against Al-Islam in America today as the enemies came out against Al-Islam in the day of our prophet peace and the blessing be on him. They can't do it because it's against the law of this country. But that doesn't mean that they are not as decided and not as bent upon doing it. They are just as decided. They are just as bent upon hurting this religion as those enemies were back then. But the time and the law is against them. So they have to meet in secret and say, laugh behind closed doors, and say, you know, we say all religion, but we agree and not going to give that religion no chance. Make sure you got somebody to watch every true believer. And let us know when any is getting serious about his religion. 
so we can plan against them. I recall the Honorable Elijah Muhammad being supported by many that he called devils. Some of them were in government offices, but they admired the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. They wished him well. But I recall also that they were there were those who were quiet. They didn't come out against him. They didn't come out for him. They were very quiet. They were silent. But they would use their power and their influences to limit the effect of his work. To make sure that his positive good work would always be in a situation where they could end it at any time they chose. I recall when he had his would have his big convention, yearly Savior's Day convention, that they would always put something in the news to hurt the spirit of his followers or to frighten them away from the meeting place. That's right. Sure did. They used the threat of retaliation for Malcolm death. Somebody's going to get Elijah Muhammad. Or if it wasn't that, they would associate the nation of Islam with the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, and give it such an ugly, ugly name and ugly image that they felt sure that hardly any of the normal good citizens of the country would respond to his call and come to his meeting. They would bring out their strongest, strongest influences at the time when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad getting ready for his great yearly mass meeting. But it didn't stop people from coming to hear the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Many would stop, yeah. But there was still enough number to fill most of the facilities that were secured for that purpose. Today they are surprised, they are amazed that we still have activities. They thought with the death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we would, be, <clears throat> we would be so taken that we wouldn't have an interest in meeting anymore. They thought the few die-hard fanatics that would be left around would be easily manipulated and sent to their destruction. But instead of what they expected happening, the son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came up in his spirit of determination, in his spirit of faith and determination, and having set down a single day since the Honorable Elijah Muhammad rested. They are amazed. Someone has to keep standing up. Someone has to keep coming before you. Someone has to tell the truth about our religion. Because we are in a society, we are in a country that has many, many persecutors. who live just to persecute the righteous, who live just to persecute Al-Islam. But again, you have to remember 
that in this day and time, and in this situation, under the law of the United States, a civilized law, a democratic law, they cannot come out openly against us. So they have to recruit the weak bastards among us and the weak bitches among us for their job, for their work. And they've always been able to find the weak ones among us. They were able to find the weak ones among us when God was preaching his message of unity, of dignity, of self-determination for the African-American people. They were able to find weak ones to carry out that dirty work. And they're able to find weak ones now. So don't think that we are not progressing because of our own situation. We are not progressing mainly because of the situation that the devil created for us. It's amazing that we have the support that we do have today from the believers here, right here. It's amazing. Therefore, they are so sophisticated now in <clears throat> fighting the influence of righteousness. They are so sophisticated in fighting the influence of Islam that we are being bombarded and are not even aware. They always manage to stage some other events close by us around the time we need right. to draw the attention away from us to something else. Right. They have made the people so dependent upon media leadership that people don't hardly respond to any call or anything of a public nature without the media not only announcing it, but supporting it and promoting it. We used to be a people that didn't depend upon so much outside help for what we were about. I'm talking about true freedom fighters. I'm talking about nationalists, the African American nationalists. I'm talking about people who wanted something for themselves and wanted to do something on their own to get it. In the past, we were not without a spirit to move on our own as we are today. Today, most of the American people don't have a spirit to move on their own. They don't move unless media moves them. It's the entertainment media, or news media, they need some media to move them. They don't move on their own anymore. As powerful as some of these entertainment figures are, they cannot get big audiences without the media. They have to have the media to get big audiences. Now we think that we're going to get a big audience without the power of the media on our side. The only way we get a big audience without the power of the media on our side, we have to go back to the spirit that we had before big media became the slave master. We have to go back depending, to, depending upon ourselves to carry the word, to impress the brother to impress the sister, to impress the neighbor, to alert the community that something great is happening here. But all of us waiting because we have been conditioned to depend upon big media to arrange our path and guarantee us an audience. The man knows the power of the media. He knows the, 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 the power of the media. He knows the importance of the media. The man of the media. Now, what I mean? So he went and he made sure that we had some time on some stations. But look how small the source of those stations is. 
Both stations are not popular. He couldn't get on prime time on a major network. No. In order to get on there, you had to kill somebody in a same way. I permit some horrible perverted act. I represent something very gross and outrageous. And then they'll flash you off. The spokesman for the black Knowing what we have to deal with shouldn't make us weaker in our commitment to be Muslim and to promote our life. It should make us stronger. There are some strong among us, but there are so few. So few. We have to bring the truth to the people and tell them that this religion is not an unpopular religion. There's a quiet work going on, been going on all the time, going on now, to make the American people think, and all other citizens of the world think, that our religion is an unpopular religion. They tried hard until I pushed the truth to the forefront in this country, with the help of God, it was my own effort that pushed the truth to the forefront here in this country, that this religion is not the religion of black nationalism of America. This is the religion of man all over the world. This is not a black religion. This is a religion for all colors. They have contained the good, the good, the productive good in the works of our Yahweh Muhammad so that it wouldn't spread and reach the many lives of our people. But they have also published the nation of Islam so that the American people would think that all oh, Muslims ain't nothing but black people that reason they were converted from crime life. You have to understand the devilishment. You have to understand the devilishment of the American people. Those hidden devils in the system of life we call America. So we have come here today spending our time and our money, our energy, separating ourselves from other attachments and other commitments. And it's worth the price if we only make it clear that this is not a religion of a special race or a special class of black people. This is a religion for all people on this earth. And this appeal is not limited to ex-convicts, a poor black disappointed in Christianity. This appeal has gone out to all people and all classes, all ranks. Doctors, lawyers, government leaders, statesmen, rulers, scientists, Embraced this religion hundreds of years ago, thousand years ago, and they embrace it today. From the people of Asia, from the people of Africa, from the people of Ireland, the Philippines, from the people of Europe, Spain, and now Germany and England, the membership of Muslims is growing fast in those waters. In Japan, 
our religious friend has. More than 50% of the people on the continent of Africa are Muslim. Most of the people from our native homeland are Muslim. And it's not the most popular religion on the continent of Africa. And they are not people from criminal backgrounds. They are the leading people, the leading people, the highest people in the society of those countries. Huh? This is the truth. This is the truth that our enemies hate to hear. Our enemy, he's burning up now. What I'm saying is like sunlight on this jacket of fall. He wished bad that he could hurry up and get into his coffin and let the lid down. <laughs> we have to come out ourselves. We are citizens of this country. We are native citizens of this country. Our sacrifice and contribution and life here in this country goes back as far for us as it does for any other ethnic group or nationalist group here in this country. Whether they come from England or Spanish Spain or from Germany or from Yugoslavia or from Arabia or from Cuba or from Haiti, no matter where they came from, our roots go back as far as they are as far as we are native people of this country. Our citizenship didn't need any government legislation. And it's embarrassing to know that we had a civil rights movement to get citizenship. It's embarrassing to know that. So who is best qualified to tell the truth about our religion? It is us. We are the best qualified to tell the truth about our religion. The immigrants were being made deportation. They have a cause to fear greater than our cause. We are in a better situation to defend our right to this religion. It has its right in the law, on the, on the law book. So we now have to tell the truth and make sure that this religion gets the right to report get the right presentation. We are Muslim. And I speak for myself as a sincere Muslim. We have accepted this religion for eternity. We didn't accept this religion as a fad. It's not just some passing thing for us. I have had enough time in my life to seriously think about this religion, to seriously wait the merits of this religion. And I'm not a fool. I got, I got a GED diploma in the days when it was hard to get one. I graduated from the high school of the Nation of Islam, as it was called, under all of Elijah Muhammad. I'm not a fool. And I haven't stopped seeking knowledge and searching for knowledge, and I can read. I read in about three languages. I can read. I'm not a dumbbell. I have had many times to read books on other religions. I did a thorough, a thorough study of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I wasn't satisfied with one complete reading. I did enough. Ain't nothing you can tell me new about the Bible if you're an African-American Christian. And I doubt if the Pope could tell me something new about it. I doubt it very seriously. Oh, 
because I have studied thoroughly. Not only that, I have books on Judaism, some of the best put out by the best scholars of Judaism. I have read them and studied them. I want to be in a position to know the strength of my religion. I wanted to be in a position to really be confident in promoting my product at Islam. And I'm the kind of man that if I find a better product, I'll put down on the weaker product and pick up the better product. But in my search to find me for the better product, I never felt not one to put down the Quran, to put down the Islam, to put down Muhammad, the universal promise. All, all that happened to me was that more faith, more faith, and more faith, and more determination to hold on to that and promote that because it's the best product. And if anyone in a decent, normal, intelligent mind would study our religion and study the other religion, his choice would be at Islam. Our God says in our religion, who would make a free choice and choose a religion other than Islam, but he who wants to make himself foolish? the national network to help us. <laughs> they are praying, they are, they are in constant meditation, uninterrupted meditation. That we don't be successful. We have to understand that our religion made a kind gesture toward Christianity and even toward Judaism. And the hand of friendship was knocked back very rudely. Our prophet speaks the best on him in establishing the first independent Muslim community or society in Medina. Wrote into the charter protection of the rights of Christians and Jews and Sabians, that was another legitimate religious group existing in those days, to practice their religion without persecution, without anyone troubling them. It is written into the child that has lasted and been preserved to the day that no church would be harmed. No church would be harmed. And that the Muslims would be obligated to defend the sacred houses, the holy houses of the people of Christianity and the Jews against any heathen or any low-life person that would come against their religious establishment. Even before the independence of the Muslim community in Medina, the Prophet looked toward the Christian government of Ethiopia and he sent his persecuted followers on a mission to go there and find a haven or a sign for themselves from the persecutors of Mecca, the heathens, people who didn't believe in the established religion of the book, the scriptures. And he told them that you'll find there a country and a leader, a ruler of that country. Who is decent, God-fearing, and the defender of the rights of the oppressed. So his followers went there and they spoke to the leader, the Nagus of Ethiopia, called the Havashi in those days. And he granted them permission to live there under his protection. 
and was so impressed with the story of the advent of their religion and the mission of Muhammad and there the Muslim, the Muslim version of the story of Jesus Christ, peace be on him and, and his mother. That he was so impressed with it that the Muslims were endeared to him. He took the Muslims to that to his heart. And they lived there in peace protected. The heathen pursued them, but they were not permitted to take back to Mecca the citizens of Arabia that had fled there. And they were not permitted to annoy those Muslims that the Prophet had sent to that Christian country because of his knowledge of its sincerity and its commitment to justice. No historian, no student of history can read that, know that, and say that Muhammad came up to wipe out Christianity and Judaism. He came up to wipe out those people who threatened the life that God intended for man on this earth. God mission him to rise up and deal with those people in those forces that threatened to wipe out the life that God intended for man on this earth. And they became jealous of his works. As his work grew, they became more and more jealous of his work. So the jealous ones in the empire of the nation, Christians, Jews, and heathens, all got together, conspired secretly, and attacked him openly, and tried that demon to stamp out his work as quick as they possibly could. But as Allah says in our holy book, it is useless that they desire to put out the light of our Islam. That God will protect his light though they hate it. And instead of them stabbing out, his followers grew. His followers grew. His mission grew faster than any similar mission in the history of man. And despite the presence of communism and foreign ideology, despite the power of Western world, to fascinate and capture the mind of citizens of country, the Muslim citizenship, the Muslim citizenry is still Muslim. We are not losing our citizens to communism and other ideologies, particularly communism. On the contrary, some of the, va some of the bravest Foes of communism are the Muslims. The Muslims of Afghanistan fighting with outdated, antiquated weapons. Weapons that hardly work. Many of them rusty. So old, we can hardly use them. But they have been able to hold their own against Russia against Russia's army. Correction, not against Russia. I believe Russia is a good people. Against Russia's army. They have been able to hold their own until now. They have been fighting now for years. Muslim freedom, freedom fighters fighting communist occupation of their land, Afghanistan. That's what the enemies don't want you to know too that this religion has people in it that have taken up the heavy mission to, to, prom to promote civilization and justice 
the will of God on this earth. They want us to think that only Western people have come into such a great mission. Before the Western man could wear a civilized pair of pants or a civilized dress, Prophet Muhammad had already preached civilization and brought civilization to the most uncivilized and darkest quarter of the old of the old world of the world then in the dark ages, the peninsula of Arabia. Where people celebrated that religion by going around naked. Went nude in their religious celebration. Where girls were not wanted when men were needed to plow the land or defend the tribe. And too many girls were an embarrassment to the man and to the family. So they would take the new girl child out and bury the child alive. And God sent the revelation to Muhammad saying for what crime was she killed and buried alive? Praise be to Allah. They don't want us to know that our religion has as its purpose and its aim on this earth the highest and noblest mission possible for human beings. Freedom, civilization, education, the highest standards for society. That's our religion. They would want us to believe that only the West has come into such a mission. When Europe was in the dark, and was given to superstition, and the oppression of the human intellect, the suppression of the human intellect, denying their female opportunity to get an education, enslaving their females, treating their females as property and as slaves. When Europe was doing that, don't think that the white man's woman have always been emancipated. Her emancipated occupation, I think, came just a little behind ours. When that situation was existing in white Western world society, the teaching that higher education is the inheritance of every citizen of the Muslim society had already been given. The teaching that is an obligation of the Muslim state to see that every male and female born in a Muslim society is educated was already preached. The right of women to go in business, to speak out in public, to protect the behavior of her government or the behavior of her, of her government leaders in the public had already been established. Richard Allen, in his book, Imperialism and Nationalism in the Fertile Crescent, he tells of a higher civilization demonstrated in the life of the Muslim when they met the Crusaders in battle. He said, it was noted that the Muslim soldier who carried the same heavy burden of war that the Christian soldier carried yet found time to bathe and wear clean clothes and to shave. He said, while they were, while, he said, we're looking back, we're ashamed of our Christian soldiers who were unshaven, filthy, bodies unclean, and looking like dirty, wild, stinking savages. You want to make a comparison? Let's make a comparison. Look at us today. 
Look at us today. America has great material wealth, frightening military power, but look at the shameful state of the American family life. Look how low American family life has fallen. Just as the Muslims towered above the Western people. In those days, in moral, in decency, in self-respect, in obedience to a moral code. Likewise today, the Muslims tower above most of the people in Western society. This is the truth they don't want you to know. So that religion, it impressed the criminals, it impressed the convicts. They were able to convert more convicts in prison than the preachers were able to convert of Christianity. But that's not the merit of Islam, that it appeals to some man locked up behind the bar. No, the merit of Islam is that it brought civilization to the world. When the youth was asleep, when the white black man of the West was asleep, when he was sleeping in savagery, it was our religion that woke the world up and say you weren't created to be dead in ignorance and immorality. Rise to your mission, man. You were made Khalifa of the earth. It was our religion that did that. And the only reason why the West succeeded in gaining global dominance over our religion is that the West was willing to stoop lower than the Muslims to accomplish that. Muslims will not set out their verses. They will not set out their laws. They will not set out faith in God to accomplish world dominance. They will hold on to God. They will hold on to their laws. They will hold on to their virtue. They will not sacrifice everything just to dominate the world. The great advances made by Europe and America in conquering the world have been advances that only a devil can stomach. Like it or not, I'm not here to make you like me, baby. <laughs> Nothing but an avowed devil can stomach what was done to advance the global dominance of the Western man on this earth. We only have to look at what was done to us to keep us down. And what is being done now? At the time when America was fulfilled her promise of justice to all men, justice to all people, the burden got too heavy, the moral obligation got too heavy on this country. So what they do? They folded up their hands and say, let the criminals take over. We, 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 we can't go any further with this. We won't do it ourselves, but let us fold our arms and turn our heads while the criminals take over. And they have given the community of the American citizens over into the hands of criminals. We live in a prison situation, right in our own home and in our own neighborhood. Our children have been taken away from us by the criminals. The criminals have lured them away from respect from us. They have lured them away from obedience to us. They have lured them away from obeying God and from obeying parents. So the great ones in the West have folded their hands and, and just as well said to the criminal, now you take over. President Reagan and his wife 
They are many by principle. Can I read their theories about fighting evils in this country? But they haven't lived with the family of man long enough to be able to do any real good for us. I hate to put it that way, but that's the truth. In the presidency of the United States, we need a man like Muhammad the Prophet, peace be on him. A very great promise. The promise of justice, freedom, and justice, and equal opportunity to all citizens. That's a great promise. In order to do that, you have to look at wrong in South Africa the same way you look at wrong in any other part of the world. To do that, you have to look at the wrong. In, in, the, in, in, in the black community, just as you look at it in the white community, and vice versa. You have to be just as sensitive to the need of one citizen as to us, not only in the domestic quarter, but also in the international quarter. Then you will be right in your heart. Then you will be able to defend the great idea of American democracy. Most of the American citizens are not even aware that our country has not defended what it believes in, not even at home, until it was forced to do so. And even then it did it deceitfully in the greater part. Small measure was sincere. And even now, the international world is waiting on our country to defend this idea of democracy in the international world. Our country will quickly become the partner of people committed to an idea that is directly in opposition to that great idea of American democracy. We'll quickly do it for more material gain, for more material acquisition, for more material dominance, for sway of power over the mind and spirit of man globally. They will do every kind of devilish thing. Now, you may feel too small and too weak to join the opposition and fight these evil influences at home and abroad. But I'm not. And I'm not alone. There are men of my color and outside of my color, of my religion and outside of my religion, that have been fighting this fight long before I was born. Men and women, they're still here, and I'm with them and they're with me. We are one in our fight against the evil that seeks to globalize itself and take over man's spirit and deny him the great future that God intended for him. Don't think we are alone, we're not alone. If I would be killed and buried tomorrow, there would be more than Muslims at my funeral than Muslims. Because they know my position. Is bigger than the small Muslim community of America. Right. Most of my difficulty with you have been because I was too big. I had to grow outside of your confines. Yes, sir. If you really understand the Quran, the Quran makes you universal. It makes you a defender of the highest and most precious 
And later she came with me to the temple. Didn't happen all at once. She took her a long time to come to the temple. She finally came. She finally came with me to the temple. I remember also walking on the church ground as a boy. And someone called out to me, said, Hey, Mohammed. They used to call me Mohammed, especially those who didn't know me very well. Because my brother was very popular as a youngster. They called him Mohammed, and when they learned that he had a brother under him, they called me Mohammed. They called him Big Mo and called me Little Mo. <laughs> so this child out loud and said, Hey, Mohammed! And the Holy Mother. She said, who is Mohammed? And I said, that's me. Get off this ground. No Mohammed are allowed. Now, I don't think that would happen today, but that happened when I was born. When I was born, they tried to make the public thinks that the mission of our prophet was the mission of Alibaba and the Holy See. Or the mission of weak tent, uh, pardon me, uh, tent brothers, weak in their home, who drank wine and had a harem of 10 or 20 women. That was the image they projected when I was born of our religion. Hollywood did it. You could find it in magazines. You could find it in the comic, comic strip. And in the newspapers. Yes. That was the image that was given a lot of women when I was a boy. Now today you must understand that the American public is a much, much more informed and educated public than it was in the day when I was born. And they know the troublemakers who want to undermine, discredit, and eventually stamp out any chance for the growth of our religion in America or anywhere else. They know that they are dealing with a much more informed and educated public. So they can't come out like that. So the war they make against Muslims is the same war they make against everybody else. That is a threat to them. A war against the spirit that God intended man to have. A war to dominate his soul, his spirit, his mind. The very human potential is a target of their weapons. The very human potential of man. You know, nature may have left our faith to the survival of the city. There's no sad thing about that. But the West claim into complement nature, claim into assist nature, claiming to lead nature for the greater life of man. leaving the situation to the survival of the city while trying its best to make as many unfit as possible. Right. 
So how can a nation claim to be civilized, claim to be moral, while at the same time doing all that's possible again to make as many of its poor, weak citizens the victim of immorality, the victim of Dr. Dope, the victim of hooligan life. Huh? You know this is false. This is false. This is false. Huh? You ain't that stupid. You know that these cities don't have the power in the presence of crime that they tolerate. You know yourself if you've been halfway awake as a human being, you know that the same media that comes behind its own work is the culprit. They sell the public a fad. And then when the fad runs its course, and another fan is needed to come in. The same media comes out and, 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 and condemns that fan. The media that, 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 that instigated the fan, the media that started the fan, comes out then and, and condemns it as evil. Because it has another one now that it wants to promote. That one has just about ran its course. They're talking about court now being a bad thing, threatening the life of American people, maybe even the security of the United States itself, the national life of this country. But I remember when the same media was selling court to the masses of the ignorant people of America. How was it selling it? By glamorizing it. It glamorized court. It glamorized the court society. And now the same media from behind his own work. That's a devil. Well, you want to go home? I do. I'm tired of living so far from home. I want to go home. In fact, sometimes I feel like E.T. The phone call will help. If we're truly Muslim, we should feel good about being here today. It's an opportunity for us to demonstrate not only before ourselves, but demonstrate to those who think they can kill our spirit, break our will, and send us back into nothing. It demonstrates to them that we are determined Muslims. That our conversion is not a fad. It's forever. Right. I would like to read to you just a few, well, I said pages, but I'm going to limit it to, to few, just a couple of pages. From a book by the Ministry of Justice in Riyadh on conferences of Muslim doctrine and human rights in Islam that have been held in Geneva, Paris, many headquarters, wrong, major headquarters of the Christian world. From this publication now I read, the Muslim zeal in studying was truly astounding. None perhaps ever surpassed them. Whenever they captured a city, their first concern was to build a mosque and a school. A mosque and a school. And in the large centers, 
these schools were always newer. Benjamin, Benjamin of Toledo, who died in 1173, reports having seen 20 of such schools for higher learning in Alexandria. Besides ordinary schools for teaching great, uh, for, for teaching, pardon me, great cities like Baghdad, Cairo, Egypt, Toledo, Cordova, and Spain possess also uni many universities equipped with laboratories, observatories, and rich laboratories in brief all the materials necessary to scientific research. In Spain alone, there were 70 public libraries. In Spain alone, 70 public libraries. We are talking about a thousand years ago, or better, in El Islam. Cordova contains 600,000 volumes. We know further from the history that has been recorded by Western writers, Western historians, that the Jews fared best in their history under Muslim Spain. The Muslims ruled in Spain for better than seven centuries. And during that long period of Muslim rule in Spain, the Jews themselves have written and documented that their life fared best under Muslims. You perhaps heard the story of King Richard and Saladin, Salahuddin is correctly pronounced his name. They were fighting on opposite sides in the Crusades. Salahuddin for the Muslim right to freedom and life on this earth. And the Crusaders for Christian dominance of the globe. And Salahuddin, being also a physician, a doctor of medicine and physician, learned of the illness of his enemy and he sneaked into their camp to spy it out but also came upon their sick hero and administered medicine to him and restored his health and he got out as he got in and contended the battle. people here today we can't be happy over the state of black America I would rather say African America we can't be happy with it why simply because 
we are still in a bad situation. We are still with a sense, a terrible, burdensome sense of insecurity. We are still a long way from getting what our soul wants. Now let the doctor of sociology and psychology let them find out exactly what's wrong with us if they want to on their own but we know that something is awfully wrong with us you know I heard that a patient once went to a doctor and the, and the doctor says, what's wrong? The patient says, I don't know. Say, so well, why are you coming to me? Say, because I'm sick. So the doctor says, well, can you tell me what, do you have any symptoms? The patient says, what? Say, do you have any symptoms? Say, what is that? Say, well, is there something bothering you in the leg? There's something bothering you in the head. Or the stomach. I don't know. So the doctor talked to this conversation went on and on, and the doctor concluded that nothing was wrong. He ain't sick. He said, hey, you ain't sick. Let's go, go. Stop wasting my time and go. So the patient, as he was living, as he was leaving for me, he said, Doc, he said, I think I'm going to die. Because I'm sick as hell. <laughs> and he just left. He knew he was sick. But the doctor couldn't find it. And he couldn't tell the doctor where, where he was, where the sickness was. We in the same situation. Here we are, an African American man, the white society, white society, white institutions of learning. They can't tell us what's wrong with us. And they look at us and say, hey, you niggas are going about this business. Ain't nothing wrong with you all. So your complaints are over. So you all just complaining for nothing. Hey, hey, go on about this business. We ain't got time to even listen to you all no more. Say, so we listen to the Haitians. We listening to the Cubans. Say, so we listen to the Koreans. We listening to the Vietnamese. Say, so we ain't got time to listen to you all anymore. You all go on about this business. Ain't nothing wrong with you all. And we can walk it away saying, we're sick as hell. We know something terribly is wrong with us. Our soul tells us that you haven't got where you're supposed to go. And our spirit is heavy upon us. It seems as though we've stopped at a door of death. Yes, for many of us it's as though we've stopped in our path toward liberty at a door of death. And some of us can't see ourselves getting past that door of death. Because they have worked to condition us for failure by building us up way up to drop us down. By building our hope way up to drop them down. See, if you want to really discourage a person from their endeavor, encourage them to put the most in their endeavor, and then plan and control their failure. And, and bring their failure about right at the point that they think they're going to get victory or success. That's what our enemies have done to every great effort on our part to liberate ourselves. They do it to our business, collective business effort. 
They do it to our collective political effort. They do it to our collective religious effort. They do it to our collective social effort. They watch us and play and play orchestrate and, 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 and work under us and work behind us and work in every deceitful way to calculate your movement, to calculate your progress, to accelerate you, oh, and to bring you down. And I told you the only way is to do it without their help. And don't be fascinated and don't be taken when they bring you some big help. If they bring you some big help, study it. You may reject it. It may be in your wisdom to reject it. If it is in your wisdom to accept it, don't get excited over it. Because if you give your spirit to it, they will destroy you. They will, they will, they will, they will, they will keep it going until your spirit is all with it, and then they will stop that help so your spirit will be dropped again in hopes of killing your will and your spirit to move on to your destiny. But we're here in Detroit at Purple Hall for Warrior today, and we're not stopping. They have not killed our spirit. They cannot kill our will. We have found a greater purpose. A greater purpose. We have found a greater purpose than equality with the white man. We have found a greater purpose than integration with the white man. We have found a greater purpose than life with the white man. We have found a purpose with God and it is eternal, baby. What they fear that will happen among us 
is that we will come into independence. They fear that we will come into independent vision. Vision to direct our life. Vision to hold for us a purpose for the whole race. Vision that will hold for us the purpose that all men's life was created for. They fear that we will independently come into such a vision. Now here is the, here is the sad truth. Not only the American white man, but also many of our Muslim brothers and sisters in Muslim land, they fear us coming into an independent vision. They will make us think we are being racist when we support one of our own and our leaders. They will make us feel that we are un-Islamic in some kind of way because we say Imam Medellin is our They want, they don't want us to address race issues. They don't want us to address the long, long problem, tiring problem of the African American man. They don't want us to address our people's dilemma. They say, don't talk about that. Just tell them what the Quran says. Tell them what the Sunnah says. That's right. That's right. But that's medicine. I got to buy medicine from sickness. That's right. Don't tell me to use medicine. Don't address the sickness. Yes, the Quran and the Sunnah is a medicine. And my people is a sickness. I'm going to address the Quran and the Sunnah, and I'm going to address my people. Yes, they are afraid that we will find a cause bigger than blind fear. Right. A cause bigger than money. A cause bigger than sex. That's right. A cause bigger than being popular. Right. A cause so big that it will give us the desire to compete with every nation on this earth. In me, and I'm not alone. I didn't want to talk this long. Are you ready to go home? I am. <laughs> you know, when you see a diamond, we were tagged. To be made food. Right. And they made us food. Most of our people fell to their influence and became nothing but a race of food. Some of us stood, stood in our dignity, but the majority of us became a race of food. You know it. now and they fear so much that they will lose their secured position of power and dominance to circumstances that will get out of control. One of the greatest fears of Western society is now and has been for some time population growth. Yes, sir. Before all of these contraceptives, pills and contraceptives were manufactured, they were busy in alarming intellectual to the great threat of population growth. But once they got all the evils lined up in place to exterminate the ignorant overpopulation, the overload in the population, they stopped talking about population growth. 
it stopped being a heated issue for them. Why? Simply because you're being sterilized. You're being exterminated. You're being eliminated by crime life, by narcotics, by vandalism, by self-destruction, self-abuse, evil can evil spirit, etc., etc. It's doing away with you. They don't have to worry about any controlling any population anymore. And teenage girls now can take their parents to court if their parents stand against them in getting an abortion. Little youngsters are threatening their parents, I'll have you arrested for trying to discipline me. So they have brought in, they have brought in a situation that they can live with. They don't have to fear now population explosion that much. But is it a situation that the victims can live with? No. We must open our eyes and understand that we can be righteous, we can be good people, we can be better in our all than the people who run this country. But if we don't have some insight into what they're doing, if we don't have some knowledge of the system and where it is, it's tactic, it's planned, it's tactic. Today, if we don't have some insight into that, our virtues, our morals won't save us. That's true. That's true. The good will go down with the bad. That's right. Yes. You may say, well, will God allow that? No. The God all the God of love, he always made it possible for the victims to have a representative. Yes, sir. And I'm not saying I know a representative that many. Yes, sir. I have a book here right now. You see, we're doing a wonderful job. It's called The Black Leadership Family Plan. It gives a plan of action to save the black community. Our families, direct our spirits, direct our energies, and keep us alert for our life, our property, and our future. Reverend Farquhar is one of the representatives of this plan. Austin Davis, I think was the first one who initiated, who asked for that plan, of such plan be drawn up. And many of our political leaders are supporting it. I believe uh, uh, the, the gentleman with the television program out of Washington, what's his name? Tony Brown. I know him well, I just couldn't think of other things on my mind, I couldn't think of his name at the time. Uh, Tony Brown also promoting such a plan. If you would read this book and see what they are advising or advocating as what should be our mission, you will see nothing new I've been preaching for 10 years. What's in this book? But not only I have been preaching, others have been preaching too. Just what's in this book. But we few are seldom heard by many. It takes people who the media have made popular, or uh, people that the government have made popular, to reach the masses of the people. So I congratulate them and I support this plan. And will do my best to cooperate with what they're doing. But I want you to know that we had this before they made it. And we are not giving this up. If things happen as they have been happening, happening in the traditional life of the African American, this will last only for a short season. And it will be put down as forgotten. Right now, I see tendencies to commercialize.
right now. And it's just in its embryonic stage. And I see tendencies to commercialize. So how long can it last? If they commercialize it. I don't think it will die fast though. I believe it's going to be around for a while. Because there's a strong, strong urge in our people today to live, to survive, to come into a better life. Strong urges in our people today. This scanty showing here, this weak showing of in, in attendance here today, don't let it disappoint you. They are hoping that you'll be disappointed. Don't be disappointed. Don't let any appearance of deficiency in us and in our efforts set you back. They may set us back dollar-wise. They may set us back real estate-wise. They may set us back even number-wise. But when it comes to our spiritual commitment and our, and our will to see our life through, they cannot set us back. They cannot set us back. A great leader, a man that stood in, on the other side of the Lying when it comes to strategy for success in this country, but nevertheless was admired by many of the Muslims and still is admired by many of Muslims belonging to my history, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said, a people oppressed once they rise up, there's no stopping short of full freedom. I believe that. I believe that. So they can work against us. They can use their courts and whatever to unjustly set us back, take our power, take our material power, take our financial power in hopes of breaking the spirit and killing the will of our community to keep going and keep realizing its objectives. But they will fail because what we have is permanent. What we have is bigger than the world. It's an attachment to God's purpose. And God's purpose is bigger even than this world. Thank you, share with you the news that uh, I received from the office of Robita. That's the uh, Muslim worldwide organization for the welfare and promotion of Al-Islam. I was told by their office in New York and correspondence that they sent me from the headquarters in Mecca that for the year, the coming year of 1987, the Supreme Council of Mosques have appointed 
your simple Imam David Muhammad. To membership on the Supreme Council. beg the pardon of Mrs. Muhammad for inadvertently omitting the introduction of her to Dias guest. Sometimes I, I think of them as, as one. But as we can attest to, to her very, very fine work as president of the Clara Muhammad Foundation, uh, she is truly and in, in indeed her own person. So, I'd like to now have Reverend Williams to present the gift to Imam Muhammad and Mrs. Muhammad. In the name of Almighty God, uh, on behalf of the Unification Church of Michigan and my, our founder, Reverend Sun Myung Moon, I'd just like to present a small token of love and appreciation for this great man of God. Thank you. particularly the universal nature of it. The fact that uh, the American Muslim or the Afro-American Muslim is identified with Muslims throughout the world and the international definition of the Islamic religion that says all men are brothers and a, a Muslim is one who seeks justice for all men. I thought it was a very fascinating message. Well, I was very, very impressed with an Imam Wardy Muhammad had to say and I think with the kind of problems we have in the uh, African-American community all over the United States that what he said was vital. It should have been packed. And anybody that wasn't here missed a great, uh, great, great lecture. Okay, how did you like the message, sir? Uh, it was very inspirational. I, it is what I feel that most Americans need to hear, especially at this day and time, seeing that uh, we have been moved by the media and influenced by the media, a, a lot of negative influence on Al Islam. But this is a plain, clear message so that people know the truth about Al Islam, how it was given to us as a religion for all of humanity, not something of a, a counter revolution or anti establishment or an underground religion, but plain. I think it is appropriate and what we need at this day and time.
to put down the Quran, to put down Al Islam, to put down Muhammad, the universal prophet. All, all that happened to me was this more faith, more faith, and more faith, and more determination to hold on to that and promote that because it's the best product. And if anyone in a decent, normal, and certain mind would study our religion and study the other religions, his trunk would be at Islam. Our God says in our little, who would make a free choice and choose a religion other than Islam, but he who wants to make himself foolish. the National Network to help us? <laughs> they are praying, they are doing constant meditation, uninterrupted meditation. That we don't be successful. We have to understand that our religion made a kind gesture toward Christianity and even toward Judaism. And the hand of friendship was knocked back very rudely. Our prophet speaks the best on him in establishing the first independent Muslim community or society in Medina. Wrote into the charter protection of the rights of Christians and Jews and Sabians, that was another legitimate religious group existing in those days, to practice their religion without persecution, without anyone troubling them. It is written into the child that has lasted and been preserved to the day that no church would be harmed. No church would be harmed. And that the Muslims would be obligated to defend the sacred houses, the holy houses of the people of Christianity and the Jews against any heathen or any low-life person that would come against their religious establishments. Even before the independence of the Muslim community in Medina, the Prophet looked toward the Christian government of Ethiopia and he sent his persecuted followers on a mission to go there and find a haven or asylum for themselves from the persecutors of Mecca. The heathens, people who didn't believe in the established religion of the book, the scripture. And he told them that you'll find there a country and a leader, a ruler of that country. Who is decent, God-fearing, and the defender of the rights of the oppressed. So his followers went there and they spoke to the leader, the Negus of Ethiopia, called the Havashi in those days. And he granted them permission to live there under his protection. And was so impressed with the story of the advent of their religion and the mission of Muhammad and there the Muslim, the Muslim version of the story of Jesus Christ, peace be on him and, and his mother, that he was so impressed with it. that the Muslims were endeared to him. He took the Muslims to, the, to his heart. And they lived there in peace, protected. The heathen, 
pursue them, but they were not permitted to take back to Mecca the citizens of Arabia that had fled there. And they were not permitted to annoy those Muslims that the Prophet had sent to that Christian country because of his knowledge of its sincerity and its commitment to justice. No historian, no student of history can read that, know that, and say that Muhammad came up to wipe out Christianity and Judaism. He came up to wipe out those people who threatened the life that God intended for man on this earth. God mission him to rise up and deal with those people and those forces that threatened to wipe out the life that God intended for man on this earth. And they became jealous of his works. As his works grew, they became more and more jealous of his works. So the jealous ones in the empire of the nation, Christians, Jews, and heathens, all got together, conspired secretly, and attacked him openly, and tried that demon to stamp out his works as quick as they possibly could. But as Allah says in our holy book, it is useless that they desire to put out the light of our Islam. That God will protect his light though they hate it. And instead of them standing out, his followers grew. His followers grew. His mission grew faster than any similar mission in the history of man. And despite the presence of communism and foreign ideology, despite the power of Western world, to fascinate and capture the mind of citizens of country, the Muslim citizenship, the Muslim citizenry is still Muslim. We are not losing our citizens to communism and other ideologies, particularly communism. On the contrary, some of the, va some of the bravest foes of communism are the Muslims. The Muslims of Afghanistan fighting with outdated, antiquated weapons. Weapons that hardly work. Many of them rusty. So old, we can hardly use them. But they have been able to hold their own against Russia. Against Russia's army. Correction, not against Russia. I believe Russia is a good people against Russia's army. They have been able to hold their own until now. They have been fighting now for years. Muslim freedom, freedom fighters fighting communist occupation of their land, Afghanistan. That's what the enemies don't want you to know too. That this religion has people in it that have taken up the heavy mission to, to, prom to promote civilization and justice, the will of God on this earth. They want us to think that only Western people have come into such a great mission. Before the Western man could wear a civilized pair of pants or a civilized dress, Prophet Muhammad had already preached civilization and brought civilization to the most uncivilized and darkest corner of the old of the old world of the world then in the dark ages the peninsula of Arabia where people celebrated their religion by going around naked 
renewed in their religious celebration. Where girls were not wanted when men were needed to plow the land or defend the tribe. And too many girls were an embarrassment to the man and to the family. So they would take the new girl the child out and bury the child alive. And God sent the revelation to Muhammad saying, for what crime was she killed and buried alive? Praise be to Allah. They don't want us to know that our religion has as its purpose and its aim on this earth the highest and noblest mission possible for human beings. Freedom, civilization, education, the highest standards for society. That's our religion. They would want us to believe that only the West has come into such a mission. When Europe was in the dark, and was given to superstition, and the oppression of the human intellect, the suppression of the human intellect, denying their females opportunity to get an education, enslaving their females, treating their females as property and as slaves. When Europe was doing that, don't think that the white man's woman have always been emancipated. Her emancipated station, I think, came just a little behind ours. When that situation was existing in white Western world society, the teaching that higher education is the inheritance of every citizen of the Muslim society had already been given. The teaching that is an obligation of the Muslim state to see that every male and female born in a Muslim society is educated was already preached. The right of women to go in business, to speak out in public, to protest, the behavior of her government, or the behavior of her, of her government leaders in the public had already been established. Richard Allen, in his book, Imperialism and Nationalism in the Fertile Crescent, he tells of a higher civilization demonstrated in the life of the Muslims when they met the Crusaders in battle. He said, it was Notice that the Muslim soldier who carried the same heavy burden of war that the Christian soldier carried yet found time to bathe and wear clean clothes and to shave. He said, while they was well, he said, well, looking back, we're ashamed of our Christian soldiers who were unshaven filthy, bodies unclean, and looking like dirty, wild, stinking savages. You want to make a comparison? Let's make a comparison. Look at us today. Look at us today. America has great material wealth, frightening military power, But look at the shameful state of the American family life. Look how little America's family life has fallen. Just as the Muslims towered above the Western people. In those days, in morals, in decency, in self-respect, in obedience to a moral code, like 
Likewise today, the Muslims power above most of the people in Western society. This is the truth they don't want you to know. Though that religion, it impressed the criminals, it impressed the convicts. They were able to convert more convicts in prison than the preachers were able to convert of Christianity. But that's not the merit of Islam, that it appeals to some man locked up behind the bar. No, the merit of Islam is that it brought civilization to the world. When the youth was asleep, when the white black man of the West was asleep, when he was sleeping in savagery, it was our religion that woke the world up and say you weren't created to be dead in ignorance and immorality. Rise to your mission, man. You were made Khalifa of the earth. It was our religion that did that. And the only reason why the West succeeded in gaining global dominance over our religion is that the West was willing to stoop lower than the Muslims to accomplish that. Muslims will not set out their verses, they will not set out their laws, they will not set out faith in God to accomplish world dominance. They will hold on to God, they will hold on to their laws, they will hold on to their virtue. They will not sacrifice everything just to dominate the world. The great advances made by Europe and America in conquering the world have been advances that only a devil can stomach. Like it or not, I'm not here to make you like me, baby. <laughs> Nothing but an avowed devil can stomach what was done to advance the global dominance of the Western man on this earth. We only have to look at what was done to us to keep us down. And what is being done now? At the time when America was fulfilled her promise of justice to all men, justice to all people, the burden got too heavy, the moral obligation got too heavy on this country. So what they do? They folded up their hands and say, let the criminals take over. We, 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 we can't go any further with this. We won't do it ourselves, but let us fold our arms and turn our heads while the criminals take over. And they have given the community of the American citizens over into the hands of criminals. We live in a prison situation, right in our own home and in our own neighborhoods. Our children have been taken away from us by the criminals. The criminals have lured them away from respect for us. They have lured them away from obedience to us. They have lured them away from obeying God and from obeying parents. So the great ones in the West have folded their hands and, and just as well said to the criminals, now you take over. President Reagan and his wife, they have many fine principles, and I believe they're serious about fighting evils in this country, but they haven't lived with the family of man long enough to be able to do any real good for us. I hate to put it that way, but that's the truth.
And the President of the United States, we need a man like Mohammed the Prophet, peace be on him. Yeah? To fulfill the promise of Allah, America. America has made a very fine and a very great promise. The promise of justice, freedom, and justice, and equal opportunity to all citizens, that's a great promise. In order to do that, you have to look at wrong in South Africa the same way you look at wrong in any other part of the world. To do that, you have to look at the wrong in, in, the, in, in, in the black community just as you look at it in the white community. And vice versa. You have to be just as sensitive to the need of one citizen after us, not only in the domestic quarters, but also in the international quarters. Then you will be right in your heart. Yes, then you will be able to defend yes, the great idea of American democracy. Right. Most American citizens are not even aware that our country have not defended what it believes in, not even at home until it was forced to do so. Right. And even then it did it deceitfully yes, sir. in the greater part. Small measure was sincere. And even now the international world is waiting on our country to defend this idea of democracy in the international world. Our country will quickly become the partner of people committed to an idea that is directly in opposition to that great idea of American democracy. We'll quickly do it for more material gain, for more material acquisition, for more material dominance, for sway of power over the mind and spirit of man globally. They will do every kind of devilish thing. Now, you may feel too small and too weak to join the opposition and fight these evil influences at home and abroad. But I'm not. And I'm not alone. There are men of my color and outside of my color of my religion and outside of my religion that have been fighting this fight long before I was born. Men and women, they're still here, and I'm with them and they're with me. We are one in our fight against the evil that seeks to globalize itself and take over man's spirit and deny him the great future that God intended for him. Don't think we are alone, we're not alone. If I would be killed and buried tomorrow, there would be more than Muslims at my funeral than Muslims. Because they know my position is bigger than the small Muslim community of America. Most of my difficulty with you have been because I was too big. I had to grow outside of your confines. If you really understand the Quran, the Quran makes you universal. It makes you the, a defender of the highest and most precious ideas and principles of man. Therefore, you can't be pushed aside into one who's now for Say, oh, he's a black Muslim. Oh, he's a black Muslim. Oh, he's a Muslim only. Now, I'm not a Muslim only. I'm a Muslim and I'm a brother and a defender of justice. Yes, sir. A brother to every man and a defender of justice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's what makes this religion so, so dangerous. Yes, sir. So dangerous. Because the African American man has to hypnotize himself to stay in the church. And they know that if the African American man ever believed that Islam is really a universally dignified religion, he will readily take off 
his greasy robe and jump right into Elisar's forearm, the foot of the prophet, all the way. They know that. They have behind them what happened in Africa. In Ethiopia, not only Christian, and Ethiopia was a strongest Christian uh, stronghold of uh, uh, footing on that continent, Ethiopia. But the people of Ethiopia now are not only Christian, we have a large number of Muslims in Ethiopia. Yes, sir. Where Christianity has been in Africa, today Muslims are there. It didn't spread among animists and who believe happy so-called primitive religion, worship ancestors. It didn't spread among such people as much as it did among Christians of Africa. Islam was accepted by the Christians of Africa. And they have to distort this religion, misrepresent this religion, keep mocking duties among us to, 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 to shame the life of the Muslim with their life that is supposed to be Muslim, to turn you off to the religion because they know, as I said, that we have to hypnotize ourselves to stay in the church. And if the truth is brought to us without a sound, that spell will be broken. And we will walk away from Christianity so fast. When I was a young boy, Christians feared so much, and they didn't always fear it. They would express it. They feared so much the presence of Islam, called Al Islam in the Quran. They feared it so much. I had a young Christian girlfriend. I invited her to go to the temple with me. She told me I had to first ask my pastor. <laughs> so I told her, okay, do that. So when I saw her again, I told her, I asked her, I said, did you ask your pastor to you go to the temple with me? She said, yes. And he said that the Muslims are not a real religion said that you Muslims are heathen. So I talked to him again, I talked again, I said, go back and ask him. I said, no. I said, that's wrong. I said, you believe in God? I went on to tell him what we believe in. So I said, go back and tell him that. So she went back, came back, I said, did he say you were going to? He said, if you come first to my church, I can go to your temple. So I went with her to her church. And later she came with me to the temple. Didn't happen all at once. She took her a long time to come to the temple. She finally came. <laughs> she finally came with me to the temple. I remember also walking on the church grounds as a boy. And someone called out to me, said, Hey, Mohammed. They used to call me Mohammed, especially those who didn't know me very well. Because my brother was very popular as a youngster. They called him Mohammed, and when they learned that he had a brother under him, they called me Mohammed. They called him Big Mo and called me Little Mo. <laughs> so this child hollered out and said, Hey Mohammed! And the Holy Mother 
She said, who was my husband? And I said, uh, that, that's me. Get off this ground. No more habits are allowed. Now, I don't think that would happen today. But that happened when I was born. When I was a boy, they tried to make the public think that the mission of our prophet was the mission of our Bible and the Holy See. Or the mission of weak tent, uh, pardon me, uh, tent brothers, weak in their home, who drank wine and had a harem of 10 or 20 women. That was the image they projected when I was born of our religion. Hollywood did it. You could find it in magazines. You could find it in the comics, comic strip, and in the newspapers. Yes, that was the image they were given of our religion when I was born. Now today you must understand that the American public is a much, much more informed and educated public than it was in the day when I was born. And they know the troublemakers who want to undermine, discredit, and eventually stamp out any chance for the growth of our religion in America or anywhere else. They know that they're dealing with a much more informed and educated public. So they can't come out like that. So the war they make against Muslims is the same war they make against everybody else that is a threat to them. A war against the spirit that God intended man to have. A war to dominate his soul, his spirit, his mind. The very human potential is a target of their weapons. The very human potential of man. You know, nature may have left our faith to the survival of the fittest. There's no thing about that. But the West claimed into complement nature, claiming to assist nature, claiming to lead nature for the greater life of man. leaving the situation to the survival of the fittest while trying its best to make as many unfit as possible. So how can a nation claim to be civilized, claim to be moral, while at the same time doing all to make as many of its poor, weak citizens the victim of immorality, the victim of dark dope, the victim of hooligan life. Huh? You know this for this for this for that. You ain't that stupid. You know that these cities don't have to tolerate the presence of crime that they tolerate. You know yourself if you've been halfway awake as a human being 
You know that the same media that comes behind its own work is the culprit. They sell the public a fad. And then when the fad runs its course and another fad is needed to come in, the same media comes out and, 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 and condemns that fad. The media that, 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 that instigated the fad. The media that started the fact comes out then and, and condemns it as evil. Because it has another one now that it wants to promote. That one has just about ran its course. They're talking about pork now being a bad thing, threatening the life of American people, maybe even the security of the United States itself, the national life of this country. But I remember when the same media was selling pork to the masses of the ignorant people of America. How was it selling it? By glamorizing it. It glamorized pork, it glamorized the pork supply. And now the same media from behind his own work. That's a devil. Well, you want to go home? I'm tired of living so far from home. I want to go home. In fact, sometimes I feel like E.T. The phone call will help. If we're truly Muslims, we should feel good about being here today. It's an opportunity for us to demonstrate not only before ourselves, but demonstrate to those who think they can kill our spirit, break our will, and send us back into nothing. It demonstrates to them that we are determined Muslims. That our conversion is not a path. It's forever. I would like to read to you just a few, well, I said pages, but I'm going to limit it to, to few, just a couple of pages. From a book put out by the Ministry of Justice in Riyadh on conferences of Muslim doctrine and human rights in Islam. They have been held in Geneva, Paris, many headquarters, wrong, major headquarters of the Christian world. From this publication now I read, the Muslim zeal in studying was truly astounding. None perhaps ever surpassed them. Whenever they captured a city, their first concern was to build a mosque and a school. A mosque and a school. And in the large centers, these schools were always numerous. Benjamin, Benjamin of Toledo, who died in 1173, reports having seen 20 of such schools for higher learning in Alexandria. Besides ordinary schools for teaching great, uh, for, for teaching, pardon me, great cities like Baghdad, Cairo, Egypt, Toledo, Cordoba, and Spain possessed also many universities equipped with laboratories, observatories, and rich laboratories in brief all the materials necessary to scientific research. In Spain alone, 
there were 70 public libraries in Spain alone. 70 public libraries. We are talking about a thousand years ago, or better, in El Islam. Cordova contains 600,000 volumes. We know further from the history that has been recorded by Western writers, Western historians, that the Jews fared best in their history under Muslim Spain. The Muslims ruled in Spain for better than seven centuries. And during that long period of Muslim rule in Spain, the Jews themselves have written and documented that their life fared best under Muslims. You perhaps heard the story of King Richard and Saladin, Salahuddin is correctly pronounced his name. They were fighting on opposite sides in the crusade. Salahuddin for the Muslim right to freedom and life on this earth. And the crusaders for Christian dominance of the globe. And, and Salahuddin, being also a physician, a doctor of medicine and physician, learned of the illness of his enemy and he sneaked into their camp to spy it out but also came upon their sick hero and administered medicine to him and restored his health and he got out as he got in and contended the battle. people here today we can't be happy over the state of black America I would rather say African America we can't be happy with it why simply because We are still in a bad situation. We are still with a sense, a terrible, burdensome sense of insecurity. We are still a long ways from getting what our soul wants. Yes, now let the doctors of sociology and psychology let them find out 
exactly what's wrong with us if they want to on their own. But we know that something is awfully wrong with us. You know, I heard that a patient once went to a doctor and the doctor says, what's wrong? The patient said, I don't know. So said, well, why are you coming to me? He said, because I'm sick. So the doctor said, well, can you tell me what, do you have any symptoms? The patient said, what? He said, do you have any symptoms? He said, what's that? He said, well, is there something bothering you in the leg? There's something bothering you in the head. Or the stomach? He said, I don't know. So the doctor talked to this conversation went on and on, and the doctor concluded that nothing was wrong. You ain't sick. He said, yeah, you ain't sick. Let's go, go. Stop wasting my time and go. So the patient, as he was living, as he was leaving for me, he said, Doc, he said, I think I'm going to die. He said, because I'm sick as hell. <laughs> and he just left. He knew he was sick. But the doctor couldn't find it. And he couldn't tell the doctor where, where he was, where the sickness was. We in the same situation. Here we are, the African American man, the white society, white society, white institutions of learning, they can't tell us what's wrong with us. And they look at us and say, hey, you Negro, go about this business. Ain't nothing wrong with you all. So your complaints are over. So you all just complain for nothing. Hey, hey, go on about this business. We ain't got time to even listen to you all no more. Say, we listen to the Haitians, we listening to the Cubans. Say, we listen to the Koreans, we listening to the Vietnamese. Say, we ain't got time to listen to you all anymore. You all going about your business, ain't nothing wrong with you all. And we can walk our way saying, we're sick as hell. We know something terribly wrong with us. Our soul tells us that you haven't got where you're supposed to go. And our spirit is heavy upon us. It seems as though we've stopped at a door of death. Yes, for many of us, it's as though we've stopped in our path toward liberty at a door of death. And some of us can't see ourselves getting past that door of death. Because they have worked to condition us for failure. By building us up, way up, to drop us down. By building our hope, way up, to drop them down. See, if you want to really discourage a person from their endeavor, encourage them to put the most in their endeavor, and then plan and control their failure. And, and bring their failure about right at the point that they think they're going to get victory or success. That's what our enemies have done to every great effort on our part to liberate ourselves. They do it to our business, collective business effort. They do it to our collective political effort. They do it to our collective religious effort. They do it to our collective social effort.